This is my 30th commencement. Uh, my 30th reunion at college is going to occur next weekend. And even for those of you who are not participating in commencement, I think there is a feeling to being here this weekend that evokes a sense of expectation, of reflection, of anticipation, of hope. That's what commencements are all about. And so even if you're not here for commencement, I hope you get that feeling, the excitement that comes. It's a time of celebration, a time of well-deserved praise, a chance to finally meet the parents we've heard so much about, and I'll, say, I'll tell you, 99% of what we heard was good. <laughs> There's a desire on the part of us who have been through something like 30 commencements to pass along our wisdom and our warnings and our hopes and our fears, but I know there's a desire on the part of those of you who are graduating to get the sitting and the listening parts over with as quickly as possible. So I will not belabor the point today. But the joy of coming to worship is that we have a much larger context in which to place something like commencement. As we gather to worship God, we have an umbrella under which to understand what's happening this weekend. And our scriptures this weekend, I think, are very helpful, though they're somewhat difficult. We won't try and capture the whole story of your years here and of our hopes for your future because we know that the same God who carried you through your toughest days here will go with you wherever you're going. God will meet you on your journey out and meet you at the next place, wherever that is. But for those of us who aren't graduating, just give us a moment to gush over you a little bit. We're proud of you. We will miss you, and we'll miss the way you uniquely reveal to us God's creative spirit. I was talking to a recent alumna this week, and I asked her, what would you have wanted me to preach at your commencement? Should I preach about holding fast to eternal truths, no matter what the challenges that may come, or should I preach about seizing every opportunity for adventure and for growth and for change? Should I preach words of standing fast or of boldly striding out? And she said, of course, both. <laughs> so that's what I'll try and do today because I think our scriptures help. I think our scriptures give us a way to imagine both. Imagine the faith we hope you will grow as you leave this place the faith you will take with you, yet the living and growing faith you will need. Our psalm today, which we sang in that beautiful setting, asks God to be a rock, a refuge, a fortress. In times of fear and anxiety, Jesus understands our uncertainty facing the future. And the Bible tells us that he says to his disciples, first off, don't let your hearts be troubled. This will be taken care of. The old hymn says, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All images of solidity, of safety, of protection. And when life is uncertain and the next step isn't clear, our faith says that God is our rock. God is dependable. But what is solid about God is not really what I believe about God because I'm imperfect. I'm not there yet. I'm on a journey. What's solid is what God believes about me. What's solid is the love, the acceptance, the embrace of God, even as my faith is chastened and corrected and grows. The danger of seeing God as a rock, as we heard in the reading from Acts, is that a rock can also become a weapon. As the story of the stoning of Stephen from Acts was read today, it's easy to forget that those stoning this young saint were not criminals, they were not hooligans. These were upstanding religious citizens whose faith had become so hardened that it could not stretch to hear his preaching. So the danger of holding on to God as a rock is the possibility that that solidity will become so hard that it cannot change. Rather, First Peter says, become living stones. And that's what I want to think about for just a minute today. What in heaven's name does that mean? First Peter's a tough book. 
what is a living stone? It says, let yourselves become living stones. Let yourselves be built into a spiritual house for you, and he means you, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you might proclaim the mighty acts of God who called you out of darkness and into light, a people who have received mercy. And if there's anything looking back and looking forward, I think this passage captures it so well because it's about the times we received mercy and the times looking forward when we know we can tell other people and show other people what that mercy looks like. It says, become living stones as Christ was a living stone, not a dead fortress, not a crusader castle, but a living community, as solid as a rock and yet living and changing and growing. The language of the stone comes from Isaiah 28 where the prophet says, see, I am laying in Zion a foundation stone, a cornerstone, a tested stone, a sure foundation, and we will call that stone one who trusts will not panic. <laughs> Great message for graduates going out and for all of us. One who trusts will not panic. And he says, I will make justice the line, the measure, and righteousness the plumb line. God is our rock, our measure, our line, but God is never a weapon. A refuge, but not a battlement. Jesus is solid, but not hard. Jesus says to the disciples in his farewell, you know the way to where I am going. But then St. Thomas responds, Lord, we do not know where you are going. <laughs> How can we know the way? And I looked at this passage all week and I was like, what is going on here? And you have to look at the words closely. Jesus is saying, you know the way to where I am going. Thomas asks, Lord, we don't know the place where you're going. We don't know the destination. How can we know the way? Thomas misunderstands Jesus. Thomas says, you, we don't know the destination to which you're going. We don't know that final place. How can we know the way? And Jesus responds by saying, I am the way. We're focused on the destination and imagine that's what faith is. That's what Jesus is. That faith is a, lo is a place. It's a location. It's a goal. But Jesus is saying to Thomas, it's the way that matters, not the destination. For you goal-oriented people, as you had to be to get through a place like Yale, it's hard to imagine faith as something that isn't also goal-oriented, that has a syllabus with a grading scale and a number of assignments that have to be done, and when you get those assignments done, you have a perfect faith. But Christian faith is not about gathering knowledge. It's not about doing anything in particular. Christian faith is not logically and spiritually working out correct doctrine and defending it to the end. Jesus is saying, I am the way, I am the path. An Orthodox theologian named Vladimir Losky writes that any true knowledge of God is not rooted in study or even practice, but in our encounter with God in the depths of our souls that may come through study or practice, but transformation comes only when we are emptied by our encounter with God and open to being then filled by God. God is not something we achieve. God is something we are a part of. I think a living stone is a person transformed by an encounter with God who comes together with others who have had the same experience. And together they are built not into a fortress, not into a set of doctrines, but into a community that lives in such a way that they are able to proclaim the mighty acts of God who called them from darkness and into light. So often I hear people say, I just can't accept organized religion. First off, I say, I've never seen it. Organized religion. But then I, what I hear in that statement is, 
a search for a freshness, for a purity of faithful encounter with God, not soiled or spoiled by history, by institutions, by the violence of beliefs that have been turned into weapons. At its saddest, organized religion is like yesterday's apocalypse, a man-made fantasy designed to capture people's fear. But the illusion is that by leaving an old church building and its pipe organ and going down the street to toads with electric guitars, we are closer to the radical revolutionary Jesus. But as history shows, today's radical experiment is tomorrow's institution. There is no escape. If you want to escape the confines of church, the only way I know is to live as Jesus taught. Because if you live simply as Jesus taught, churches won't know what to do with you. Not with any goal in mind, not with old or new institutions at heart, but live simply as he taught. I had jury duty last week when I called my brother, who's a trial consultant, and I said, how do I get out of jury duty? And he said, be honest and clear in all your answers. <laughs> and you will automatically be excused. Sort of like that with church. If you follow Jesus, the church won't always know what to do with you. That's how to find the living faith. In his poem, For the Time Being, W.H. Auden wrote these wonderful words about following Jesus. It says, he is the way. Follow him through the land of unlikeness. You will see rare beasts and have unique adventures. He is the truth. Seek him in the kingdom of anxiety. You will come to a great city that has expected your return for years. He is the life. Love him in the world of the flesh. And at your marriage, all its occasions shall dance for joy. We send you out in the belief that the God we know in Jesus Christ will find you wherever you land up. God will find you when you meet others whose lives, like yours, are not their own, who feel strangely compelled to love, to forgive, and to hope, compelled by a strange encounter with God, an encounter they may not be able to put fully into words, but that they cannot help but live out every day. If you go looking for a community, look for that. You will meet this God when you least expect it, when you take ridiculous risks, when you step off the prescribed path, strangely you will find God the refuge, the rock, when you are willing to let go of some of the certainties you thought most foundational. Strangely you will find God the goal when you let go of trying to acquire God and allow God to acquire you. Strangely you will find the church not where there are numbers of people or aesthetics or perfect doctrine, but where people honestly love each other and their neighbors for Jesus' sake. You'll find them, and they'll find you. Amen.